Well, good afternoon, and uh, I would like to thank you for coming out um, this afternoon to support this, um, this initiative. This is our fourth uh, provost in the spotlight. Um, it was designed really as a forum you know, for us to highlight the accomplishments of a unique and achieving in faculty member here at the university. The question and answer format is used uh, to allow us to learn more about the, the scholarship, the motivation, the challenges, and background and personal interest of our faculty members. This is really an idea I, I borrowed many years ago from IUPY, when I was a faculty. And back then, it was called the last lecture. And the last lecture is designed for faculty members in the last the semester. And I really don't like the name. Last lecture seems like that is an absolute, you're done, you're gone, be, uh, be, be quiet. So I, I thought, how about if we flip that over? Just, you know, when faculty is still here, where we know who they are, and they're very productive, they're very engaged, why don't we spend the time to learn more about them? So that's really the, the genesis of the idea of this initiative. But this afternoon, I will, we are delighted to, uh, to welcome um, Dr. Helen you know, Crompton, who is an EPS expert in STEM education, and she's one of the nation's uh, world leading authority on mobile uh, learning. The host of the spotlight is uh, Dr. Annette Finley uh, Crosswhite, who uh, is director of the Center for Faculty Development and also herself a very distinguished uh, professor of history. Um, she has invited um, to the stage th this afternoon to work with her as co-host, Dr. Paul uh, the current who is our um, new senior international officer. So in a few minutes here, you will learn why she decided to invite uh, Dr. the current to help out with the, uh, with the interviews. But before we start, let me give you a, a brief background on our distinguished uh, faculty member, Dr. Crumpton. Her CV is about 100 pages long, but I decided that we probably don't want me to spend that much time you know, you know, giving you you know, her background uh, um, this afternoon. But let me do, hopefully, do some justice to what she has here. Um, she, she is an associate professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning in the College of Education and Professional Studies. Um, so originally from England, she came to the United States for graduate work and received her PhD in Educational Technology and Mathematics Education from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in 19 in 2013. She arrived at ODU that year and was recently promoted to the rank of associate professor. Dr. Crompton's research focus is on educational technology, particularly on the use of mobile devices such as cell phones and tablets for learning in STEM. She has developed effective strategies for providing inclusive learning for refugee children underrepresented groups and students with disability by using mobile devices. Dr. Crompton has presented at national and international conferences on the topic of education technology and has published over 100 peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and white papers in the field. She was officially named as one of the nine mobile learning experts in the world by the United Nations Technology Division, ITU. By chance, if you walk by her office, you will see her talking to her robots that she has in her office. Dr. Crompton holds many awards in the United States and the United Kingdom for her service to the field of educational technology. At ODU, she has distinguished herself as an excellent researcher and outstanding no teacher. Earlier this year, she became ODU's 32nd Chef Outstanding Faculty Award winner when the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia named her as a rising star. Please join me in giving her a warm round of applause. <laughs> now I will turn the stage over to Dr. Annette Fiona cross white to begin the, the conversation. Thank you. Several years ago, one of our colleagues, Lisa Mays, who's the executive, executive director of the Center for High Impact Practices, thought 
that it might be interesting to have a forum that modeled a TV show called Inside the Actor's Studio. If you've ever watched that, it's hosted by a famous director, critic, writer by the name of James Lipton, and it's been running for about 20 years or more. Lipton uses a question and answer format as a master class because actually he's bringing in famous actors to talk to acting students. And the first, the very first episode was framed around Paul Newman. So, oh, there you go. <laughs> at any rate, um, if you've watched it, you know that at the end of the show, Lipton is famous for pulling out yellow cards and they have off, <laughs> they have off the wall questions on them. So in our preparation for today, um, we have talked to Helen a bit about what we might address, but there's also questions she doesn't know about that we'll be, we'll be talking about today. I wanted to invite my friend Paul Current to be with me here on stage. He is, um, as the provost said, our new senior international officer because Dr. Crompton is from Great Britain and Paul is from Great Britain. And I thought the two of them could have some interesting banter up here. Since we're videotaped, you know, to, to make it more lively and interesting. Um, and so it's also my way of introducing to you as well my colleague, Paul, who was educated largely in England, but also got his PhD in theater and drama from the University of Georgia. Um, he's held positions all over the world for many years in France, uh, most recently at Radford. And as we've already said, he's our senior international officer here since last summer. So I'm going to um, begin the, the first, with the first question, and then Paul and I will alternate after that. Usually we have a theme when we, we meet with someone and we talk with them about the development of these questions. And I think today's theme, I mean, we'll wander here and there, but today's theme really is about using new technologies to promote inclusive learning. So without further ado, I'll pull out my TAN cards. Um, the provost mentioned that you're one of nine leading experts in the world on mobile learning. I mean, that's amazing, right? Nine, one of nine. So um, maybe we need to know a bit about what mobile learning is, but the first question for you is, how did you first become interested in mobile learning? So, um, well, to begin, Paul Newman and Banter. <laughs> oh my goodness, you, you've kind of made me a bit nervous now. Um, so mobile learning, I became interested in, first of all, when I was working with children with severe behavioral problems in the UK, I, we brought along some technologies and they became really interested where they were interested in learning before. So the motivation was my first draw towards technology. But then I thought, no, you know, rather than have them tethered to the computers there, I want them to get out, I want them to experience learning. So when mobile devices came in, the iPod Touch, um, I started working with a school that had the devices and we could move around. We could take them to ponds and look at pond life and we could do those sorts of things, um, really contextualizing learning. So that's what got me interested. And did you find students responded really well? To yeah, so it was beyond the enthusiasm. Okay, the enthusiasm was there, but the learning sciences show students learn in particular ways. They learn when the best connected learning with the environment. If you're connecting learning, like I said, to ponds, why not go and look at those ponds? Technology acts as, especially the small devices, act as cognitive tools to take them further to do more of what they can do with the support of technology. So and they must have been thrilled, so they didn't have to put their technology in their book bags, right? They could pull them out and, and use them in class. Yes, actually what's interesting about mobile technologies is many things brought into schools, everyone's very positive. Computers in schools, great. Mobile devices in schools have had the very opposite effect of, yeah, you can't bring those things into schools, you know, and they banned them in most countries mm -hmm. um, until they realize, oh, okay, why are we banning them? It's empowering students to learn. If we, if we want to find out an answer to something, what do we use? We use technology to do many things, and that's what's so beneficial. And I know many of you are thinking, well, you know, we also need to do it without technology. It's like um, washing machines. When washing machines came in, many people probably thought, well, 
You know, are, are these children that are learning to wash clothes, are they going to know the temperatures? Are they going to know how to wash? Are they going to, you know, are they going to lose all those things? But that doesn't matter. Let's throw them in the washing machine. Let's use technology. Then we can go and do things more important. The mobile technologies are like that. They help us do things further, but then um, they reduce the cognitive load in many other ways. So. Great, thank you. So Annette and I met with Helen a couple of weeks ago to prepare for this, and um, your stories are just fantastic. I think we should just let her talk for about 30 or 40 minutes, but uh, I'll try something. Helen, I know you've worked with the United Nations and UNESCO, and especially with ref refugees and people in developing countries in the context of mobile learning. Can you share how that came to be and what you've learned? Um, so, getting in contact first of all, I got a phone call from Geneva from ITU. ITU is the International Telecommunications Union, which is the technology division of the United Nations. And they had a very long conversation with me and then they asked if I could consult for them. So I started working with them in that capacity and I've um, published things with them um, under their name. And then um, UNESCO, the intelligence division, about a year later, they contacted me to do the same type of things. And I work with UNESCO actually um, a lot more. I, I work with them, I go every year to Paris to the headquarters and they have policy forums on mobile learning in many developed countries and I work with the world leaders there. They invite 20 researchers and I'm one of those that can go in and help the research aspect in that you know you might have the ideas on what it, you want to do but then we can come along and say this is what the research is showing. So that's um, I, I present for them and I also author for UNESCO so that's how I kind of got in contact the refugee section, though, was that um, the Greek government asked if I could go in there and do an educational needs analysis of the refugee camp. So that's how I kind of got into that. But um, the second part was the learning. Yeah, um, well, learn? people in developing countries and the interest in the, in the context mm -hmm. of global learning. Uh, and what have you learned from this? I learned... Um, various things. I learned that people have a lot of misconceptions about refugees and that was a large one as I actually spoke to people about refugees and I'd explain about the devices and many would say they have a device and there's a misconception there that they don't have things like mobile devices and they don't have often intelligence. These are often very um, articulate people that have great professions in their own countries, not in Syria, and they've ended up in a very unfortunate position. And when they've left their homes, what's the first thing you're going to grab? Is your mobile device, because that's what keeps you in contact with your family, and that can help empower you in many other ways. So I learned that, and I learned as well as myself as a researcher that research can be really hard sometimes. I go a lot into schools and I work with children in the US. This was very different. Um, I was very aware from the work I'd done with UNESCO that people have ideas on what they, they think is going to happen. So for example, if you go into a refugee camp and ask questions about their education for their children, they automatically have this assumption that you're going to fix a lot of things and provide a lot of things with the questions you ask, but that's not always the case. You know, that I, I have the findings, I pass them to people, but I'm not sure how much they're going to act on them. So as a researcher, that was a great learning curve for me in understanding my feelings and being able to, yeah, cope in difficult situations sometimes with some difficult stories that I heard. Yeah. I remember when you first talked about people, the refugees in the camps having mobile phones, our reaction I think was, well, how can I afford these uh, AT&T plans or whatever, so, but they've got an ingenious system of doing mm -hmm. that, now, what, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean a lot of refugee camps, in fact I don't know any that don't have Wi-Fi, they have a lot of Wi-Fi and also um, they often pay them um, they give them money weekly to spend on what they want and again they prioritize mobile phones because that's the device as well that they're going to be able to look and say okay where am I going to next you know have I been has my processing 
to go to another country have been updated because a lot of us connect with refugees in the US. Connecting with refugees that are only on the first part of their journey, it looks very different. So um, again, the priorities are very different. Can I ask a, a question here? In the refugee camps with the mobile phones, and I remember you telling me being shocked when you said they all have internet, right? But are in the camp itself, are kids using the phones to follow schoolwork and, and things like that, that they must need to continue, mm -hmm. right? I mean, is that going on too? So um, there's a very long answer to that, uh -oh. <laughs> but I will keep it short because that was my educational needs analysis of what they were doing with the devices, um, how they were being used. They have schools there, mm -hmm. but they are unofficial schools, so they can't leave with any qualifications. So, um, but they do know that they need skills to be successful and be financially secure. So the one thing is language. So adult learners will always use a device to go on to YouTube and places like that and um, learn a language. And I've met many that could speak fluent Greek and fluent English um, just from using YouTube. And yet there's so many other programs out there that, that can help them. But um, they're also concerned about their children because there is the fact that there's a full generation lost for the children not getting schooling and not getting what they need. And they're very conscious that when they are able to get into schools, they're going to be way behind from just learning the alphabet, learning basic addition. So um, again, the mobile devices, they don't ever replace a teacher. But when a teacher's not there, the adult can use the mobile device to help learning and it can supplement. Hmm. Um, so that, that's a big one. In fact, an interesting one is, um, they want to learn geography because they're moving. And um, quite often I work with children in Lesbos, um, sorry, everybody in Lesbos. And they are, Lesbos is situated right next to Turkey, nearly within swimming distance. And they can quite often get there and they think they've got to mainland Greece. And they're kind of very shocked to find out they're on a little island. So then geography becomes a priority in what they want to learn. Geography, mathematics, reading, um, and then languages. Great. Thank you. Mm. I know that um, after we spoke, I guess I should interject. I've always been one of those professors that would tell my students to put their phones away. And after we spoke, the very next class, I, I had them do an exercise with their phones. So there you go. <laughs> I felt guilty, you know. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, so what is the most exciting aspect of learning with technology that you can convey to our audience today? So um, technology can have learning in a way it should be. When we're wanting to learn about something, like I gave the pond analogy, um, they need to connect to what it is. It's like um, if you are teaching children about the Great Wall of China, we might describe certain things, but they don't, we might understand what we're saying, but they don't always have the full understanding about these things. When we're describing a big wall or showing pictures, it's, it's not easy to grasp the concepts. However, with technology, you can do things like virtual reality. They can take them on a field trip. Now, a lot of these things are free. You can make the devices out of pizza boxes, and a lot of teachers do. And they have, the programs are free, like Google Expeditions, and they can actually, physically see in 3D what the Great Wall of China looks like and experience walking along the wall and visiting places that um, it's that contextualized bit. When we're learning, if it's contextualized and it's connected to other parts of knowledge that we have, the schema, um, it makes it a lot deeper for learning. So. Just, I'm going to the Great Wall of China on Sunday, in fact. I don't think I'll bother now. I'll just Get myself a pizza box. So I have to add a bit to that. Okay, so it also takes us to places that we couldn't possibly go. I mean, we can't take children to the whole class of the Great Wall of China. Uh, well, I can't afford it anyway. <laughs> but also, ethically, we cannot cut somebody open and show people things. Well, we could do, but we might be in trouble. But um, with virtual reality, they could be a cell, uh, a blood cell, and be traveling around the body, it allows you to do things and see things from a perspective that you could never do without technology. That's what I like. 
And often technology is used to replace things that we've always done. Like you'll see digital worksheets, kind of what on earth is the point? <laughs> you know, you might as well just do paper and pencil, but technology can do things that we can do so much more, like going to the space station. No, you couldn't possibly do that, but you can with virtual reality. Okay. Um, as a scholar, what are you most proud of in terms of your research and its impact? So um, that's a difficult one because obviously working with students with disabilities, seeing what we can do with technology, working in the refugee camps, that kind of comes to mind. However, like I was kind of hinting on before, technology is only a tool. It's how it's used that's really, really crucial. So I would say out of all the research I've done, my work with teachers in how to effectively use technology, that is the most important because technology doesn't always have a positive name, it's used in many negative ways. I was a classroom teacher for 16 years and I remember what it was like. We'd, we'd be given a new gadget and it was kind of, what do I do with it? And they feel like they've bought it, so they've done the hard work and they're handing it to me, but I don't always know what to do. So what's really nice is um, thinking about how educators can effectively use it. And I developed a social ecological theory, a framework of what we need to think about as they do integrate the technology. And so that was kind of the research part. However, I, I feel very passionate about taking that into schools. So I also worked with the International Society for Technology and Education. I've worked with them for 10 years, working with teachers across the US and further. And they have standards on how to use technology. And I've worked with them very closely on that. And I wrote the book to explain how to use those standards in schools. And they're actually in all schools in the US, at least one copy. Good. Um, that was, I was going to ask you that later. But my question then would be is, do you get any resistance from um, um, stick in the mud teachers like uh, Annette Finley Crosswhite who really aren't <laughs> aware of uh, the uses to which a mobile phone could be put? Or do you find that people are more receptive? Um, I am so glad you asked that question because <laughs> It's a bit of both, and it's not that people are being difficult. It's the fact that often we do things based on prior knowledge. You learn to cross a road by practice and knowing that, you know, okay, I've been told how to do this. However, with technology, we can't look at back at past lecturers, past teachers, and go, oh, they used it this way, because they didn't often. We get into a stage now where we are having to completely rethink education and that's very difficult we have to think out of the box we have to take risks we have to do a lot of reading and a lot of educating so it's it's often you have to think about that as well that the big part is getting them prepared getting educators prepared and showing people what they can do but it, it won't be a fast thing um, and you want people to do it right as well so a lot of people might I've been in classrooms and we're using virtual reality and we're using very cool things. But then you say, okay, so what are the students learning? Oh, um, you know, and they've not connected it to what they're learning. Yeah. And in that way, it's being used negatively. So it's going to take time for people to use it correctly. But I've had people cry, um, physically cry, because they've been told to use the technology and they're very nervous because they don't know how to. And, and so it is difficult. Do you feel that you have to understand the technology intimately in terms of the engineering or, or are you, is, is yours more of a theoretic, theoretical and, and, and practical rather than um, engineering uh, input, if you like? Oh, okay. Um, so I hope not because I don't have the computer science background that many people do. No, I connect with lots of other people um, that have that knowledge. So I focus on the, um, the use side. And for other people using it, it's good to have the, know the basics of how it works, but also really how to use it. And my focus is on pedagogical aspects, how to teach effectively with it. Did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Can I just ask a question? Have you gone any, down any um, dead ends and blind alleys that has, in your ex explorations? Mm -hmm. Or has it been continued success from the beginning? <laughs> Um, that's interesting because 
with a lot of failures, that's where you can learn the most. I've, I've used, and I seem to be famous, I get called the robot lady, which I've not done as much with the robots, but I have a robot about this high, two, the now robots, and we took them into preschools, and we thought, they'd do a great job, you know, and they can dance with the children, and show them when they fall down how to interact, because when the robot falls, it will say, oops, I've fallen down, let me get myself up, and it'll stand up, and, and we found out it did great things with that, but we also found that young children's voices were way too quiet. Oh, wow. So they couldn't do a lot of the verbal interacting, so that was what could be classed as a failure in that way, but no, it's, it's just we learn more about the robot, that it's great for these things, not good for these things. Okay. Sounds good, sounds good. All right, this is very much a similar question, but more introspective. Okay, so how would you describe your life as a scholar? Smashing. <laughs> All right, my question. <laughs> um, it's great. Obviously, Stephen, my husband, is my priority in life, but otherwise, work is my priority. I, I, um, People have jobs and then they have a career. I think of mine as a career and a life, but I really enjoy what I do. But if I got up and won the lottery and they said, no, you don't have to work again, I'd love the money, but I would be disappointed if I couldn't work. If it, when I wake up in the morning and I think, oh, I don't have to work, but I could also get that paper done, or I could work on this, or I can research, that sounds so much more fun. So I really enjoy my work. It's who I am. It defines who I am. And I know to many people, they might think, oh, no, you should, what is the term? Work to live, work to live, not live to work. I live to work. If we were in a forum last week talking about the word scholar and what it meant mm -hmm. to people, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, to, to me, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the highest accomplishments, okay. right? Um, and it sounds like uh, it sounds like you've given us insight into that side as well. I very much love my job. I remember in the old British passports that you had to put in your what was it your your job basically or your or your career uh -huh. in one word. So what would you put down as your? Oh my goodness. Um, the occupation, I suppose. Hmm. Would it be scholar or researcher? I was going to say professor. Does that kind of cover those things? Absolutely. Academic. That would work. I'm not sure. Um, so the question is, can you tell us a little about your current research? But you can tell us lots if you want. Well, the most, uh, uh, most exciting parts of your current research. Okay. I'm sure it's all exciting. Yes, all exciting. I have always multiple things going on because they come around and they need work at different times. Um, but I have um, two projects that I'll share. So one is virtual reality. So I, I'd kind of described this before, but we're going to go into a middle school and we're going to work with children learning about um, World War I and life in the trenches. And the typical um, history lesson is that you get pictures and you get a story. And if you remember back to being in school, it was kind of, oh, that's, that's a great story. It was like watching a film, a movie that it's nice, but you don't actually connect thinking it's real, that people actually went through those things, they did those things. So we're using virtual reality, and we're gonna have two classrooms. One classroom is gonna have the traditional story and pictures, and the other one are gonna have um, virtual reality, views of what it looks like in the trenches. And um, they're gonna see the, how they had to cook in the trenches, how they were often forced to go over into no man's land and they get uh, experience from actually being in the shoes of the people. They get to look around and see people there but alongside them often looking nervous holding the rifles and we believe at the end of this knowledge retention is going to be so much more because when we when we hit when we connect to the affect not just the cognitive it has such a deeper memory but also um, so knowledge retention is a big one. 
but also historical empathy in understanding what that person felt at that time. So, um, so that's one. The other one is I've been looking more at AI, so artificial intelligence, and um, what we'd like to do is we found out universities instructors, they spend a lot of time answering student questions. Students can ask sometimes very basic questions because they get nervous about what's on the syllabus, um, what does this look like um, for my final assignment, and it'd be nice to use a chatbot instead with IBM Watson that can help answer those questions. So if they wake up at one o'clock in the morning, oh, they probably didn't go to bed till, till that time, but they have this question. They can go straight onto the website, just type in the question, like, um, I'm thinking about this topic from my final assignment, would that work? And the chatbot will use the IBM Watson, which is a very intelligent artificial intelligence, and it'll be able to answer them straight away. And then what's nice as well is, well, the instructor doesn't have to get up and answer things, but it also gives them time to work with individual students on other things. So it's kind of offloading that task. But then the chatbot also, the artificial intelligence system, will collate all those questions that students are asking. So then the instructor can go, oh, look, we see a trend here. And what questions are asking that I can then develop my syllabus further or my course further to help answer those questions. So it's kind of offloading but also giving the instructors so much more um, information. I am actually now a world expert on chat boxes after having gone to a conference with the Provost last week. So this is a question. Um, the trouble supposedly with the chat box is that um, they take a long time to start because you can't analyze questions if you have no questions and so it takes a long time to build up a database of questions and some people therefore have decided not to invest in it. What would be your response to that Dr. Cron? Oh good good one. Um, so they're just using chatbots. Yeah. Chatbots with IBM Watson. IBM Watson is an intelligence in itself but what it does is I will give um, IBM Watson all the information about the course. And what it will do is it will look through all that. I don't have to anticipate all the questions. I'll, I'll anticipate some, but the IBM Watson can actually think for itself and say, oh, it's asking questions about that. Did that answer your question? Yep, that's basically what they said. <laughs> <laughs> they did say, though, that uh, even the greatest algorithms could only predict about 95% of the questions. And you need, to, at the end, to have a human person there. To answer certain questions. Certain questions. I guess that's you. <laughs> yes, but it's kind of nice so they'll be able to offload the rest. And yeah. the instructor role will always be there to answer questions. It, technology can never replace a teacher. That's a, that's a huge one. It's, it's got to be the mantra, right? <laughs> it's only a tool, but yet it's a very effective tool. You know, Helen, you're making me rethink all the things that I do. You are mentioning historical empathy there, oh, right? Yes. And Forever, I have told my history students, because I'm a historian, don't think you know, don't think you can really know what they knew in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, we always have a sense that we know more than people in the past. Um, and certainly, I'm not saying that that has been totally rewritten by what you've said, but it's interesting mm -hmm. how you could get students closer to the mindset of a particular mm -hmm. period of time. So I find that very exciting. Anyway, the questions now are going to get a little bit lighter, okay? Um, we know you're from Manchester, right? <laughs> so how in the world did you end up at ODU? <laughs> so while I was at work one day, and I've had this question many times before. Um, so when I was at work one day, my husband, Stephen, um, applied online for me to teach in the US, and he forgot to tell me. Uh, and I got a phone call um, saying, oh, we've fast-tracked you through the system. We'd like you to come in for an interview. And it was kind of, thank you. What for? <laughs> and, oh, yes, I applied for you online <laughs> for the visiting international faculty. So, so I came over on that. I taught, because um, I taught 13 years in the UK. I taught three years in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Then I got a scholarship to UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I did my PhDs there, and then I came straight to ODU. And the rest? 
Right? It's history. It's history. Right. <laughs> um, Ellen, uh, what do you think the classroom of 2050 will look like? Very different. Very... You know when you picture classrooms and the still the rows of desks or the tables and chairs, I don't think we'll have any of that. I think it will be very hands-on. You see, again, people with technology think, oh, you sit at a computer. No, you work with the materials and the technology is there for when it's needed. I, I believe it's going to be very fluid. Students are going to be out a lot more, actually, authentically learning, doing these things without being told about the things. They're going to actually experience them. That's, that's how I picture it. And Will there be walls? Possibly not. Yeah, in many cases, not. So. Especially out at the pond. Yes. Will this not create a divide between those societies or countries or schools who can afford the technology and those that can't? Okay, so that's the usual one as well. Um, again, with technology, these divides are being greatly changed. Okay, so for a, a recent one I actually came across when I've been working with artificial intelligence in that um, you'll notice students from um, affluent families grow. They, they get education and they get a great um, background from parents that are very knowledgeable. Those parents that haven't had the opportunity to have, to have the education cannot always bring their children on and they can't have those conversations as well or help them with the homework and do things like that. Artificial intelligence with um, the tutors and things like that that are coming out that are going to be free, many are already. Students can have all that as if they have a parent there that is very knowledgeable. So we're going to see a huge shift in being able to allow them to have the opportunity. So technology is actually doing the very different. It's like um, in developing countries, tethered technologies were no good. However, with mobile technologies, they completely leave for all the rest of the technologies and now they're, they're doing so much more with technology. Um, so, so it's actually helping reduce many divides that you couldn't reduce without having the technology. Sounds good. Does that make sense? I think so. I think it's time for Paul's famous yellow cards here. <coughs> now they're going to speak. Ready? They're going to speak British English, and maybe I'll translate. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'll start. I'll start with an easy one, and the least embarrassing. Oh dear. Uh, what talent would you like to have? Oh, I would like a talent. Um, I would like to be able to dance. I can't dance. I'm from England. We don't have any rhythm. <laughs> yeah, no rhythm. Would you no. like to see Helen dance? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, question number two. Helen, uh, I am from the south of England, and you are from the north of England, Woo! where I believe most houses now have electricity. <laughs> um, do you see any differences between those of us who are from the south and those of you who would like to be? <laughs> um, yes, interesting. Um, that is clearly spoken by a person that envies the northerners. But um, it's hard to really dignify that with a response. <laughs> I thought you might say that. Well, what do northerners have that southerners don't? A humour? Um, <laughs> lots. lots. No, that's too long to answer. You know. um, right. Uh, as a writer of over a hundred articles in recent years, what is your favourite smell? <laughs> the smell of chocolate. So, kept me going through all those papers. British chocolate. Uh, oh, good. Okay. Uh, which you can't officially call chocolate, apparently, because it doesn't contain enough cocoa solids, so anyway. Oh, yes. the best stuff, though. Yeah. Uh, and so what is your unfavorite smell? Um, coffee. Mm. I've not got into drinking coffee yet. and In fact, I shouldn't say that. I've not got into drinking coffee. 
So, yeah, I don't like the smell of coffee. A last official question. Uh, just tell me your most embarrassing moment at ODU. <laughs> Apart from this one. <laughs> okay. Do I tell this story? So, I was in the new education building. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, gosh, I feel myself going red. Um, so I was in the new education building and I saw someone and they looked a little bit lost and I was thinking, hmm, I've done a lot with Norfolk City. They look so familiar. I think it could be the city manager or something. So I just, I spoke to them and said, can I help you? And they just started talking and I said, um, I have to say, I recognize you and I can't think, I can't place you. He said, I'm the provost. <laughs> And was he lost? I am so sorry. <laughs> it was early on, and I'd only seen pictures at this point to defend myself, but um, yes, that was very embarrassing. Uh, good story. <laughs> uh, I have a, a final bonus question. Uh, the longest place name in the, in, uh, the United Kingdom, it begins Wanfe Filquin, and it, mm. and it ends Klantisilio Gogogog. But there is no one in the entire world who can pronounce the whole <laughs> name, or is there? Please. I can. So um, it's a Welsh name. It's called Langfire Puff Gwyn, otherwise, but the, the full name is Langfire Puff Gingich Gerishrim von Billem Siliogogoch. Great. Thank you so much, Nolan. Thank you, Paul.